Chapter six is gonna be more about solving equations, but before we solve equations, we need to talk about the inverse of trig functions, which is the thing that allows us to solve these functions. So just throwing it back to the definition of an inverse function, this is like some algebra moment. We're leaving trig for the, just this page. A function is defined that every element in the domain corresponds to one and only one element in the range. Basically, the x's cannot repeat. That's things that we've learned since algebra one. So if point A comma B lies on the graph of F, then there is no other point on the graph that has a as an x coordinate. You cannot repeat your x's. That's the definition of a function. However, with a function, other points may have b as a y coordinate, meaning the y's can repeat because th the definition of a function allows output values to be used more than once. When we're working with functions, we've always used the vertical line test to check to make sure that a graph represents a function. Now, a definition we may not have hung on to from algebra was a one-to-one -one function. So getting more particular than just a general function, a one-to-one -one function is defined so that each output value is used only once. So a function, x's cannot repeat, the y's can. But in a one-to-one -one function, neither the x's or the y's can repeat. So since it is a function, just like the definition ahead, if point A, B lies on the graph of F, then there is no other point that has A as an x coordinate. But for a one-to-one -one function, only that one coordinate can have B as the y coordinate. You can't repeat your y's for a one-to-one -one function. Since we're checking something else, no repeating y's, we use the horizontal line test to check to make sure if a function is a one-to-one -one function. If a function is one-to-one, -one, meaning it passes the horizontal line test, then it has what's called an inverse function. The inverse function is the inverse, let's just use the same word to define it, it's the function that undoes the application of that function. Definition-wise, it says the inverse of a one-to-one -one function f is defined to be as follows. This is pronounced f inverse. f inverse is equal to y's comma x's, given that x comma y belongs to the function f. So basically, all this is fancy speak to tell you to switch x and y. Which is the same thing we did when we studied inverse functions in the algebra portion of this course. We just switched the x's and y's and then we had the different function. Since we're switching the x's and y's, the domain of x becomes the range of its inverse and the range of f becomes the domain of the inverse. Domain and range are x's and y's, so you switch them. So domain and range switches. Therefore, if a, b is on the regular function, then just switching that point b comma a is on the inverse. In fact, the functions f and f inverse are reflections over the line y equal to x, which is just the positive diagonal across your graph going this direction. So if you had a line perfectly across your graph with a slope of one and a y-intercept of zero and you folded your graph along that, the two functions would land on top of each other. Algebraically, if you are finding an inverse function for a function, there's just three simple steps. Step number one, you're going to switch the x and the y, because they're switched. Then you're going to resolve the equation so that it still says y equals, and you're going to replace f inverse with the variable y. So just like make it fancy right at the end. And that's finding an inverse function. Now that's algebra, and we'd been doing algebra in the first part of this course, which was actually doing these things. But let's apply this to trig because there are some interesting things when it comes to the inverse of the sine, cosine, and tangent functions. For the inverse sine function, yes, yes, the way we write it is two options. They mean literally the same thing, just depending on what textbook you're reading, and your textbook goes back and forth between the two, so they mean the same thing. This is inverse sine, or you'll see it written as arc sine. They literally mean the same thing. What happened was old textbooks, when we didn't have like a typewriter that could do exponents, they needed some way to show this was the inverse, so they used arc sine 
as like being able to type. And then when we got better at computing and able to do exponents, we we're like, well, it's an inverse, so let's just show it as an inverse. Both are the same. You will see both. They mean the same thing. Here's the problem, though. This is the function sine. And if we right now did the horizontal line test, does this graph pass the horizontal line test? Does it pass through that graph only once? No, so we have to do something about that. So what we do is we restrict the graph between two values that would allow it to pass the horizontal line test. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna only select this itty bitty portion right here. Because if I chop off the rest of it and only look at the portion between neg negative pi over two and pi over two, does that little red portion pass the horizontal line test? Yeah, look at all these horizontal lines. Does it ever cross just the red portion more than once? No, so we're good. That passes the horizontal line test. Oop, I erased too much. So this little section is the section that is defined to have an inverse for sine which means we're not gonna be able to answer all of the questions for this problem. You're only gonna be able to give me answers that are between negative pi over two and pi over two. Again, this domain. That's what we're restricting our graph to so that we have an actual inverse. So what I mean by that is, if sine of x has a domain typically of all real numbers, like it extends for forever, and its range is from negative one to one, its inverse is going to flip the domain and the range. So right now, the range of sine inverse is negative one comma one. Sorry, I said range, I meant domain. The domain of inverse sine was the range of regular sine. And I would love to just be able to write negative infinity to infinity for the range of inverse sine, but we just said that we have to chop this graph off only between these two values so that it actually passes the horizontal line test which means the range here is actually only going to be that highlighted section from negative pi over two to pi over two. Meaning today, when you give me answers, you will only answer with an angle between negative pi over two and pi over two. I have some visuals here that might be helpful from your textbook. This is what it looks like when you graph inverse sine. Notice that the outputs, again, are only between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Those are the only answers you can give me today. Looking at it on a calculator, zoomed to just that little section, this is what inverse sine looks like. If you right now were to plot this point, which first of all, the class in front of you is working in the polar coordinate system, so picking up this calculator means you need to second plus 712 because you will get a weird looking graph if you try right now. Uh, but if you graph this, it would be zoomed out further than this, so it would look like a tiny little stick, but it is showing you that the outputs are only between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. What I think is the most helpful visual is applying this to your unit circle. So pretend this circle right here on the graph is your unit circle. Those of you who have your unit circle paper plate, hold it up in front of you. Which two quadrants are highlighted here that we can use? Yeah, quadrant one and quadrant four, which is the all and the cosine quadrant. Okay, take your paper plate unit circle and fold it in half so you're only looking at quadrant one and quadrant four. Go ahead and fold it. Okay, those are the angles that you can answer questions today. They're only ever gonna be from that side of your unit circle, quadrant one and quadrant four. However, you're not going to answer quadrant four angles that are obtuse, you're going to give me negative angles. So right now, uh, this angle, there's four that we need, or three that we need to talk about. Typically, this is um, 11 pi over six. This is typically seven pi over four. And this one is typically five pi over three. Do you agree with me? Is that what your unit circle says for those angles? Working in radians? We're going to change those into the negative version instead of a positive angle which means this 11 pi over six is actually just negative pi over six. Seven pi over four is actually just negative pi over four. And five pi over three is just negative pi over three. So when you're working with your unit circle today, you're not answering 11 pi over six, but that same angle is coterminal with negative pi over six, which is the way you can answer my questions today. Now what 
inverse sine and cosine are going to do is return to you the angle value that gives you the ratio that's plugged in. It's basically backwards inverse of the questions you did on your gym kit. So today, A through C here, I want you to think of as if it's a regular sine and cosine problem like the gym kit, and we're going to work backwards. So by asking you what is the value of y, if y is equal to the arc sine of 1 half, I'm basically asking, look around your unit circle and tell me what angle I would have to plug in to get an answer of 1 half. On your unit circle, sine is the second coordinate. So what is the coordinate I would need to use, what is the angle, sorry, I would need to use to get a y coordinate of 1 half? Pi over 6. So we would say y is equal to pi over 6 because that's the angle I would put in here. Sine of pi over 6 is a half. We're just working backwards because our output is an angle as opposed to our output being a trig ratio. So for the next one for part b, y equal to inverse sine of negative 1 is basically like saying, all right, what is the angle I plugged into sine to get an output of negative 1? So look only in those two quadrants for where the y coordinate is negative 1. What's that value? Ooh, thank you for saying 3 pi over 2. We are not allowed to go all the way around the unit circle to 3 pi over 2. So we want to say this, but what that means, don't write that down for a second. What that means is that you've started at the positive x-axis and gone around like this. I'm not allowed to touch these two quadrants for inverse sine. So I have to arrive at the same location in a different way. So instead of going around the unit circle like that, I want to go around the unit circle like this. What would that angle be if I went down? Negative pi over 2. So again, we can't answer with 3 pi over 2 because it's outside of the domain or outside of the range. So this would just be negative pi over 2 going the opposite way. Let's go ahead and write that one down over here. That way we have it written down, negative pi over 2. I forgot about that one, instead of 3 pi over 2. All right, part C, y equal to inverse sine of negative 2 is like saying, what angle can I plug into sine so that it gives me negative 2 as the answer? So look around your unit circle. Is there an output of negative 2 somewhere? a y value of negative 2. Hopefully your spidey senses are saying, well, these only go from like negative 1 to 1. Does sine ever get to be 2? No, this is no solution. That is outside of the domain of sine inverse since it's only going from negative 1 to 1. You can't plug in a negative 2 there. So again, we're working these values backwards. We're working with having trig ratios and looking for angles, where with the gim kit we did before this, you were given angles and you gave me the trig ratios. We're just working backwards. So that's sign, quadrants one and quadrant four, but we're not going around the unit circle. We're gonna use negative angles. Cosine inverse works the same way. There's two ways you can see it. You can see it as cosine inverse or arc cosine. But again, if we looked at a graph of cosine and immediately did the horizontal line test, does it pass? It does not pass the horizontal line test, so we have to get smart about this and pick a section of the graph that does pass the horizontal line test. It's kind of bolded in here, so we'll go ahead and just give it to you right here. If I go from zero to pi, does that little section right there pass the horizontal line test? Yeah, so that is the section we're going to restrict our domain of the function to so that it actually passes the horizontal line test and has an inverse function. Same thing. If we look at the domain in the range here, the range of inverse cosine is negative 1 and 1 since I'm switching the x's and the y's. And it would be nice to be able to write all real numbers, just switching that one over there, but we have to restrict it so that it actually works. That means that the range here is only going to go from 0 to pi. Again, the visuals here are really helpful. If you graph inverse cosine, notice it's only going from 0 to pi. That checks out. On your calculator, changing the screen to only show you on output from 0 to pi, that's what it will look like. 
Again, on a negative 10 by 10 screen, it kind of looks like a tiny little stick because it's very small, but it works the same way. Again, what I think is the most helpful visual is this right here. What two quadrants are highlighted for inverse cosine? The first and second, the first and the second quadrant. There's no real trick with cosine. Because we can travel around this unit circle to the top two quadrants, so our fold of our paper plate unit circle would be the other direction, we don't have to think about negative angles. You can just read the unit circle like normal. All of the values that are on your unit circle are good to go. Yes? Why is it the top two? Because we restricted it from zero to pi. If you think about our unit circle, this is zero, this is pi. So we're only using the top two quadrants because it goes from zero to pi. So you can never go to zero to negative Not for inverse cosine. Mm -mm. Yeah, and so on the sine graph, because it was from negative pi over two to pi over two, and we wrote down that this was negative pi over two, and we know this is pi over two, that's why it's those two quadrants. That's the restriction we're giving ourselves so that it actually has an inverse function. But that means cosine doesn't really have a trick to it if you have your unit circle in front of you. We're just going to be able to see the values that are there. They might be obtuse angles, but they're good to go. So my question for you is, I want to know the value of y if y is equal to the arc cosine of 1 half. Again, the way I like to think about these questions is saying, all right, what is the cosine value that would return to me the value 1 half? What is the angle I would plug in there? to get 1 half, pi over 3. So y is going to be equal to pi over 3. And I know I'm working only in radians. You'll have to go back and forth between radians and degrees, but your unit circle has both written on it, so it's really no big deal. Number b, I want to know why if y is equal to inverse cosine of negative 1. My brain sees this problem and says, what is the angle that would return to me negative 1 for cosine? And what is the angle that would return negative 1 for cosine? Cosine is the first coordinate, by the way. Mm, no. It is pi. I think you were thinking of tangent. And then last but not least, again, I like to flip it back into regular cosine when I'm doing these for myself. What angle would return the output value of negative square root 2 over 2 when I take the cosine? 3 pi over 4. Yeah. So I didn't have to go into negative because I'm allowed to look at those top two quadrants, and that means I'm going positive angles the whole time from 0 to pi. So I'm just reading that top portion of my unit circle. When I work these and I'm not familiar with them year to year as I forget things, I really do fold my unit circle in those different ways. So like I would have folded this like this and only read the top of the graph, top of the circle. Of course, we still have one more trig function, tangent. Same thing, it can be written in two ways, inverse tangent or arc tangent. It's the same thing, but since this one is also periodic, if we were to immediately do the horizontal line test, does it pass? No, because it crosses that graph more than once. So we again have to restrict the domain so that we can only cross the graph once. Now, if you look in between the vertical asymptotes, there's like a whole curve of tangent that is completed between one vertical asymptote and the other. That's going to be the restriction we give ourselves because one of those entire curves never repeats horizontally, so we would pass the horizontal line test. This means that the domain we're going to use is very similar to sine. It's from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. But what's different from how I'm writing this one compared to how I wrote sine? Flip back to the, the sine page. What's different about that interval that we highlighted? Say again? Yeah, this one has parentheses instead of brackets. What does that mean? It can't be exactly negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. It's going to be undefined there because look what's happening at negative pi over 2. What's this called? Asymptote. An asymptote. We're not allowed to touch or get close to infinite. 
we're allowed to get infinitesimally close to it, but we cannot actually touch that value, so we have to exclude it from the domain to make sure that it's still a function and that it passes a horizontal line test. Everything else works the same as the other inverse functions. So the range is the same range. So if the range of tangent is negative infinity to infinity, that means that is the domain of inverse tangent. The range, though, is going to be the... Um, Wow, I think that's a whole typo. That's not the right domain for tangent. So go ahead and mark this out. Let's actually write the correct domain. This should be all real numbers except that x cannot be equal to negative or pi over 2 plus k times, why am I blanking, plus pi k meaning every repetition of the vertical asymptote we have to take out of the domain. Sorry, that was a big typo on me. Wait, Ms. Quigley, why is it all real numbers? Except that R cannot be equal to the vertical asymptotes. No, for the inverse. Because I'm taking this range, these flip-flop. The range of the regular function becomes the domain of the inverse. But we don't just automatically switch the domain to the range because we had to restrict the values that we were using. This is where that negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 comes in because we're only allowed to do the inverse where we get an output value between those two values. Here's what inverse tangent looks like when you graph it. It is just one of those little squiggly curves but it goes from negative infinity to infinity, so it goes on for forever. This is what it looks like in your calculator. But again, what I feel like is the most helpful visual attaches this to your unit circle. We're back to using which two quadrants? Quadrant one and quadrant four, which means just like with sine, I'm not going to be able to give obtuse angles here. I'm going to give acute angles in quadrant one and negative acute angles in quadrant four. So let's rewrite those values down just so we remember. Um, in normal, the obtuse version is 11 pi over 6, and then 7 pi over 4, and 5 pi over 6. The negative coterminal angle there would be negative pi over 6, negative pi over 4, negative pi over 3. I wrote the wrong number down here. This is a 3. And just because I know we'll probably need it, we'll change it. Okay, so when we're folding our unit circle for this one, again, oh, I dropped everything. We're folding it on the y-axis so that we're only looking at quadrants one and four for the values that I can ask you for inverse tangent. So if I ask you to find the value of y, given that y is the arc tangent of zero, the way my brain hears this question is I'm looking for the angle to which if I take the tangent of it, I get zero. So look on your unit circle for where the tangent would be zero. Now, tangent is not written directly on your unit circle, but tangent is the ratio of sine divided by cosine. So you're looking for some sort of fraction between the values around your unit circle that becomes zero. What is that angle? What angle of tangent gives you zero? That one would actually be undefined. Zero. zero. Uh, Tangent of zero is zero. Since sine is zero there, zero divided by one is still zero. So for this one, y is equal to zero. This may be where it's helpful to remember that table I had you copy down a million times last quarter for your um, vocabulary quizzes, since the unit circle doesn't have tangent written on it. For B, I'm asking you to decide what angle would I have to plug in to tangent so that the output is 1.
where the ratio is the same on top and bottom. Mm-hmm, pi over four. So y equals the inverse tangent of negative square root three over three is like me asking, what is the angle that I'd have to plug in there to get negative square root three over three? Now again, this one's a little bit more difficult because tangent is not listed, but if you remember what value normally gave you positive square root three over three, then you can apply that to the negative version. Is it five pi over? Oh, negative you said pi over six, right? <laughs> no. Oh, well, let's say yes. Yes, it's negative pi over six. So normally tangent of pi over six is square root three over three. So if I want negative square root three over three, I go to negative pi over six. What might be helpful for you, since tangent is not around our unit circle, if you would like to add the tangent values on all of these angles, I'll be okay with that on your own unit circle. Now the reciprocal functions, secant, secant, and cotangent also have inverses. This is what their graphs look like, and their words are said the same, you know, arc cotangent, arc secant, arc cosecant, which is a lot of words to say all at once, but this is what their graphs look like. We're gonna mostly just write down their domains and ranges so you understand uh, input and output values you can get. For inverse cotangent, the domain is all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity, and its range is gonna be from zero to pi. I can tell this from the picture of it since it goes off screen left and right, but has a horizontal asymptote at zero and a horizontal asymptote at pi. That's where I'm getting these values. It's bookended by those things, bounded. For arc secant, the domain is going to be from, sorry, wrong color, from negative infinity to one and then from one to infinity. I can see that from the screen. That's also the range of secant. So it becomes the domain of inverse secant. The range of this graph is from zero to pi, but the value cannot be equal to pi over two because of that horizontal asymptote there. For cosecant, the domain is negative infinity to negative one. I forgot the negative on this guy. And then from one to infinity, which is the range of regular cosecant. The range of inverse cosecant based on the graph goes from negative pi over two to pi over two, but what value can it not be? Well, where's the break in this graph? Oh, zero. zero. So the value cannot be equal to zero. I think I put x's there and it should be y's because it's domain, I mean range. So looking at these graphs, we can identify the domain and range of these functions. What I'm more interested in you being able to do is evaluate the functions. So using your calculator to do this as well as by hand, but knowing how to do this in a calculator is maybe helpful because we don't have cosecant, secant, and cotangent values as memorized as the others. If you are plugging this into a calculator and you wanted to evaluate inverse secant, you would type it in as inverse cosine of the reciprocal, okay? Because there's no secant or cosecant or cotangent button, so you have to use its reciprocal, which means you just use the reciprocal of the input value. Same for cosecant. And same for cotangent. However, if 
the x value that you're plugging in for cotangent is less than zero, so it's a negative number, you need to add 180 to the answer. So let's see some examples of using this just because I think it will be helpful. The first uh, examples here we'll do without a calculator. Find the degree measure. So this time we're working in degrees. Q is equal to the arc tangent of one. Basically, I'm asking what is the in what is the angle I'd have to plug into tangent to get one. And we're going to do this in degrees this time. Forty-five degrees. Make sure because we're going to be going back and forth between degrees and radians that for me when you're writing down a degree you show me the degree symbol on your computer i'm pretty sure it already has it typed in the, the degree symbol so you'll be fine for part b we're doing this inverse secant of two here's how we do this secant especially when we're doing it in our head this is asking me what angle for secant would give me a value of two we don't have the secant, cosecant, and cotangent values memorized, so let's translate that using an identity. Again, I kind of lied to you there, Ava. We're still using identities, but the easy ones. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, so it's really like asking, what is the cosine of a half? Where'd the one half come from? Mm -hmm. I just used the reciprocal of this number. The reciprocal of 2 is 1 half. And now on your unit circle, what angle would give me 1 half for cosine in degrees? In degrees, yeah. Yeah, you were right. 60 degrees, you were right. So when we're doing this without a calculator, you do need to translate it back into something that you have a resource for, which is sine, cosine, and tangent. For C, we're really asking ourselves, what is the angle for cosecant that would return 2 square root 3 over 3, which we don't know. So we switch that into one we do know, which is sine, that's the reciprocal, meaning I just flip this guy over. Now right now, I still don't have a value that makes sense to me because there's a radical in my denominator. So we rationalize that denominator by multiplying by square root 3 on top and bottom. This becomes 3 square root 3 over 2 times 3. The square root 3 square root 3 cancel out to just give you 3. Well, I noticed that there's a 3 on top and 3 on bottom. Aren't those going to cancel? So I'm really asking what value for sine returns square root 3 over 2. So look on your unit circle for where the output value, the second value in the coordinate, is square root 3 over 2. 60 degrees again. But when all else fails, you do have an ability to type these things in the calculator. So let's practice. We're going to find y in radians. Notice it says in radians. You'll have to go back and forth between your modes at this point. If y is equal to the inverse cosecant of negative 3. Now we're not going to flip this one around or anything. We're just going to plug it into the calculator. But if I wanted to plug cosecant of negative 1 what no so, sorry inverse cosecant of negative three into the calculator i look right above this to that little calculator section and it says cosecant inverse is evaluated as inverse sine of one over whatever number was plugged in so this number that was plugged in goes in a denominator but that's something i can type in my calculator there are inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent buttons above the regular sine, cosine, and tangent. So you press second, you press sine, you make sure you're in radian mode. 
and not in polar mode as my class before you would be. You will get a bunch of decimals and you'll round it to the nearest or keep four decimals. So this will end up being negative 0 0.3398. To find that angle, notice it says in degrees, so we're gonna have to switch our modes here to degrees, if Q is equal to arc cotangent of negative 0 0.3541. I wanna type that in my calculator, so I'm gonna look up there and see how to type a inverse cotangent, which is doing uh, inverse tangent of one over that value, negative 0 0.3541, however, that number I'm plugging in is a negative number, which means what am I gonna have to add to this value to get the correct answer? Plus 180. So switch your calculators to degrees, and you can type all of that just in one fell swoop. Inverse tangent, one over that long string of decimals, close parentheses, plus 180. You don't have to put the degree sign, we're in degree mode. Correct. If it just said, like if this was not there and it just said 0 0.3541, you would not need plus 180. You only have to add 180 if the x value you're evaluating is less than 0. And that's what that formula is telling you, the piecewise formula. When you type all of that in and you make sure you're in degree mode, you should get 109.4991 degrees. Make sure if you're answering in degrees that you put the degree symbol for me so I know you're in degrees. I'm pretty sure the computer says that you are in degree mode or puts the degree symbol, so you should be okay. Just make sure the mode you're using on your calculator makes sense. Last but not least, let's do some more complicated questions. So we're going to find function values using definitions of the trig functions. So we're going to evaluate these expressions without using a calculator. It says to find the sine of inverse tangent of 3 over 2. An inverse function returns an angle measurement. So this still works. I'm plugging an angle into a sine function. I just have to figure out what that angle would be. Or I use the idea of inverse tangent to just find the missing piece of this triangle for the sine function. What I mean by that is we're gonna come off to the side and we're gonna do x, y, and r. Same way we've done x, y, and r for a long time. Notice on the inside of this function, it gave you that tangent inverse is three over two. When we do tangent, what are these two values? Are they x, y, or r? Y over x. So I can go ahead and fill in that y is 3 and x is 2. Because tangent inverse of that value means that's the output y over x. Well, Once I have a y and I have an x, I can find r by doing Pythagorean theorem. We'll do these two values squared and added together. Three squared is nine, two squared is four, nine plus four, 13. Since the angle that the tangent value would give me, I'm plugging immediately back into the sine function. When I find that angle, which I'm not even actually gonna find, I just need to do the sine for the values that are created in this same triangle. Sine is y divided by r. So this would be 3 divided by square root 13, which I would just quickly rationalize my denominator to be 3 over square, sorry, 3 square root 13 over 13. So again, I used the inverse trig as two parts of the triangle values, x, y, and r, that I needed to do the sine in the first place. I never actually found that angle. I could have used a calculator to do that, but instead I found the exact value without a calculator. So that means to do this kind of problem again, 
the tangent of inverse cosine of negative 5 over 13. What values did I give you, x, y, or r? x and y, because cosine is x over, sorry, x and y? No, you didn't say x. R, yeah, X and R. So I know that one of them is going to be 5 and one of them is going to be 13. My question for you, can the radius ever be negative? No. No, so that negative needs to go with the X. Radius is not negative. Radius is a distance, and distance is always positive. Okay, so that means I can find this missing piece. I can find out the Y using Pythagorean theorem. This time, since I have the radius, instead of adding these two values, I'm going to subtract the radius Sorry, I'm going to subtract the leg from the radius. So I'm doing 13 squared minus negative 5 squared, which is 169 minus 25, which is 144. And what's the square root of 144? 12. 12. If we notice that's a Pythagorean triple, 5, 12, 13. Could cut you out some time if you noticed that. So if I ask you, what is the tangent of the angle returned by inverse cosine of negative 5 over 13? All you really need to do is do the tangent using these values, x, y, and r. And tangent is what divided by what? Um, y, over y over x. So we're just going to do 12 divided by negative 5. Voila. So inverse trig gives you two of the sides. Mm -hmm. You can here. A negative can go top, bottom, or side, but if there's two, then they cancel out. Yeah. That's a good point. doesn't matter where you put it. On the homework, and I put the negative in front and the negative. Really? Those are mathematically equivalent, so it shouldn't have counted that wrong. I don't know why. Okay, can I make it a, or are there any questions before I uh, amp it up a bit? Okay. If we extend this a little bit longer and apply it to some of those identities that we had last class and last unit, I notice right away that this looks like it's the cosine of the sum of two angles. So in my head, what I'm thinking about is this identity that we used last time, the cosine of A plus B. Those of you who still remember it, what is the definition or what is the identity for cosine of A plus B? Mm-hmm. Very good. So what I can do is I can do exactly what we did in A and B for the example before this for each of the angles given here and then plug it all in. So I'm going to take a little bit of a sidebar down here and I'm going to, because I have two angles here, I'm going to split this into two. So here's going to be A and here's going to be B. I need to find X, Y, and R for the angle A and I need to find X, Y, and R for angle B. Okay, we're focusing angle A on this guy right here. Square root 3 is, is just like square root 3 divided by 1. And if that is tangent, arctangent, what two letters did they give me, X, Y, or R? Y and X. So I can put square root 3 there and I can put 1 there. I can use Pythagorean theorem. To find r, this would be doing square root 3 squared plus 1 squared. Well, square root 3 squared is just 3, and 1 squared is 1, which is the square root of 4. And what is the square root of 4? 2. Fabulous. What about for b? What do I fill in for x, y, or r? Y and R, because this time it says arc sine. Sine is Y divided by R. So that means for the Y I have 1 and for R I have 3. Do a little Pythagorean theorem to find X. 
This time, since I have the radius, I'm gonna start with the radius and subtract the other leg. This is nine minus one, which is square root eight, which if you simplify that radical, it ends up being two square root of two because you'd break the eight down. Eight is four times two, four is two times two, pair of twos left over two. Okay, let's throw all of this into the identity that Damani told us earlier. We want the cosine of A. We're getting all of the A values from here. So if I was writing cosine, cosine is X over R. So cosine of A is gonna be one half, X over R. What's the cosine of B? Cosine is still X over R, but I'm using the B values. 2 square root 2 divided by 3. Then I want the sine of A. What would I write down for sine of A? Square root of 3 over 2. Of three over two. That's Y divided by R from the A list. Now what about sine of B? We're doing sine. Y over R? Oh, just one over three. One over three. We just do some arithmetic. Top times top, bottom times bottom. One times two square root two is two square root two. Two times three is six. What, square root three times one is square root three. Two times three is six. Simplify this into one denominator. This would be 2 square root 2 minus square root 3 all over 6. So I did exactly like we did in example 6. I just had to do it twice since we were using two different angles here, angles A and angle B. Let me color code this in case you are lost and don't know where I'm getting these numbers from. This is going to be all the stuff for A, A, a and A, and that's this. And then here's B. These are the numbers we put into B, which goes here, 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 this stuff, this stuff, and this guy. Tangent is Y over X. Number B. Now tangent of two times the arc sine of two fifths. Because we did not go over the double angle theorems, we're gonna apply this as another one of the sum of tangent formulas. So what we can do is we can rewrite this into an identity we do know, that this would be the arc sine of two fifths plus the arc sine of two fifths, right? Two of those, they add together, you get two. So I've not changed anything. We're just not gonna use the double angle theorems because we didn't learn them. If you know them, go for it. But this just means that we're going to have the angle A and the angle B for tangent. Can anyone remember the tangent of the sum of angles formula? I'll give you a hint, it's a big fraction. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There it is. So we're going to fill this in eventually. We just need to know the angles or the values for A and B to do this. What's nice is we really only have to do the like Pythagorean theorem thing once because it's the same angle. So I'm going to do this where I'm going to highlight this time in green and purple. So here's the green. All of this is the green. And then I have purple. 
But the green and the purple, if you notice, I've highlighted the same thing. So A and B come from the same, like, X, Y, and R. They're the same angle. So I do this once. Since I told you that the arc sine of two-fifths is what I'm using, did I give you X, Y, or R? Bless you. It's sine y and r. So this is 2, this is 5. So if I use Pythagorean theorem, I was given the radius, so I subtract away the leg. That's 25 minus 4, which is square root 21. This one gets some messy arithmetic, so use your nice, neat handwriting. If we plug all this in, and I'm going to zoom in so that I have a little bit more space. To fill this in, I would have the tangent of A, which is tangent of its Y over X. Wait, I don't need to put tangent again. The tangent of A is Y over X, which is 2 over square root 21. And I'm going to leave it there for a second on purpose, just so you have it. And I'm going to add the tangent of B. Well, it's the same thing. 2 over square root 21. All of that divided by 1 minus the tangent of A, same value, 2 over square root 21, times 2 over square root 21. We can't cancel, but we can simplify significantly. The top, they have the same denominator, so we can just add them together. That's 4 over square root 21, and I'm going to leave that square root there for now. We'll fix it before we have a final answer. We're going to do top times top, bottom times bottom to multiply those two fractions together. The denominator ends up being 1 minus 4 over plain 21. Square root times square root cancel out if they're the same number. What is 1 minus 4 over 21? Well, these would have to have a common denominator to make that happen. So I'm going to change that to 21 over 21. 21 minus 4 is 17. So we would do 4 over square root 21 divided by 17 over 21. We've got a fraction on top, fraction on bottom. What are the rules? Keep, change, flip. So I keep, change, flip. Four times 21 is 84. Square root 21 times 17 is 17 times the square root of 21. And now that it's nice and neat, we can get rid of that radical. Multiply by 21 on top and bottom ends up giving you 84 square root 21 over 17 times 21, which is 357. And because it's a fraction, we do have to simplify that fraction. 84 over 357 reduces to 4 over 17. Keep the square root 21. Uh, 17 times 21. Because if I multiplied the top and bottom by square root 21, that square root 21 would cancel and leave a square root or leave a 21 there. 17 is also there, so I have to multiply them. 17 times 21 is 357. And all I did from those big numbers to the 4 over 17 is reduce the fraction. Now, I left this last example in here on purpose from my shot put friend. Finding the optimal angle of an elevation of a shot put. So this is an application of inverse trigonometry. 
The optimal angle of elevation Q for a shot putter to achieve the greatest distance depends on the velocity of the throw and the initial height of the shot. This makes sense to you, yeah? As an actual shot putter? Okay. I've never thrown a shot put in my life, so that's why I have to check. Okay, see the figure. One model for Q that achieves this greatest distance is Y equal to the arc sine of all of that that I'm not going to read out loud. So if an athlete can consistently put the shot with the height of 6.6 .6 feet and an initial velocity of 42 feet per second, what angle should the athlete release the ball to maximize the distance? Since we are just needing to know that angle and my formula that I'm already given in this problem is solve for an angle, since it's using an inverse sign, meaning I'm getting an angle out of it, all we have to do is take these values for H and the value for V and plug it in into the formula. So this is for sure a calculator question. And since it says what angle, what degree, you would tell someone an angle in degrees as opposed to radians. We're going to make sure our calculator is in degrees before we do this. But we would just plug those numbers in. Y is going to be equal to the inverse sine of the giant square root of 42 squared over 2 times 42 squared plus 64 times 6.6. .6. They gave me all the things I needed. There's no actual solving in this problem because it's already solved for the angle. Since the formula is given and it's an arc sine formula, that means it's returning an angle. So if we throw all that into a calculator and make sure we're in degree mode, you should get out 41.9309 degrees. So if we were studying the physics of this shot putter and we knew their height and we knew the initial velocity they normally release the shot put with, we could train them to hit it at this particular angle to maximize the distance that the shot put would be thrown, which is pretty cool.